it's amazing to see so many speakers, so many readers, so many storytellers. So we hope that you come almost on every time they have it. So we're honored to be part of it. Um, just a little bit about the Story Box project. It was started in 1995. At the time, I was serving as the first full-time high school storytelling teacher in the country. Uh, and I met a woman from Brazil, and she said, I wish there was a way we could trade our stories, but there's too much distance between us. And so I went to my students. I ran a storytelling group called Voices of Illusion, and they said, well, why don't we send our stories to them? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, but this is one of the story boxes of the 50 that are in and around Columbus. And as far as Singapore, this particular one is at the Multicultural Center. Uh, but I'd like to introduce someone that's going to talk about how they're using a story box in a different way. Than, and also she's going to share a story. So please give a wonderful hand for Miss Talia Weiss. Um, hi, I'm Talia, and I'm, um, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, so, um, I'm, um, organizing the, uh, with what I'm calling the Israel-Palestine Storybox Project, and my goal is to collect, uh, personal narratives from, um, Palestinians, Israelis, Jews, and Palestinian Americans here in Columbus. Um, and just their perspectives on the conflict and their connections to Israel-Palestine. And um, I'm doing that through the Storybox Project, and um, my hope is to uh, bring those stories together and create um, a theater performance based on them. Um, so that's, that's kind of a brief, brief summary of the project. And I was actually going to read a personal story, but um, today um, somebody gave me um, a letter that was written by um, an Israeli reserve soldier um, who had um, who had been in Gaza and he had stayed in the home of a Palestinian family. They were not in their home. Um, and he wrote this letter to them and left it in the house. Um, and I thought, I haven't actually read through the entire thing yet, but I thought I would just read a selection from that. Um, it's called, I am the soldier who slept in your home. Hello. While the world watches the ruins in Gaza, you return to your home, which remains standing. However, I am sure that it is clear to you that someone was in your home while you were away. I am that someone. I spent long hours imagining how you would react when you walked into your home. How you would feel when you understood that IDF soldiers had slept on your mattresses and used your blankets to keep warm. I knew that it would make you angry and sad, and that you would feel this violation of the most intimate areas of your life by those defined as your enemies, with stinging humiliation. I am convinced that you hate me with unbridled hatred, and you do not have even the tiniest desire to hear what I have to say. At the same time, it is important for me to say the following in the hope that there is even the minutest chance that you will hear me. I spent many days in your home. You and your family's presence were felt in every corner. I saw your family portraits on the wall and I thought of my family. I saw your wife's perfume bottles on the bureau and I thought of my wife. I saw your children's toys and their English language school books. I saw your personal computer and how you set up the modem and wireless phone next to the screen, just as I do. I wanted you to know that despite the immense disorder you found in your house that was created during a search for explosives and tunnels, which were indeed found in other homes, we did our best to treat your possessions with respect. When I moved the computer table, I disconnected the cables and laid them down neatly on the floor, as I would do with my own computer. I even covered the computer from dust with a piece of cloth. I tried to fold the clothes that fell when we moved the closet, although not the same as you would have done, but at least in such a way that nothing would get lost. I know that the devastation, the bullet holes in your walls, and the destruction of those homes near you 
place my descriptions in a ridiculous light. Still, I need you to understand me, us, and hope that you will channel your anger and criticism to the right places. I decided to write you this letter specifically because I stayed in your home. I can surmise that you are intelligent and educated, and there are those in your household that are university students. Your children learn English, and you are connected to the internet. You are not ignorant. You know what is going on around you. Therefore, I am sure you know that Qassam rockets were launched from your neighborhood into Israeli towns and cities. How could you see these weekly launches and not think that one day we would say, enough? Did you ever consider that it is perhaps wrong to launch rockets at innocent civilians trying to lead a normal life, much like you? How long did you think we would sit back without reacting? I can hear you saying, it's not me, it's Hamas. My intuition tells, you, tells me you are not their most avid supporter. If you look closely at the sad reality in which your people live, and you do not try to deceive yourself or make excuses about occupation, you must certainly reach the conclusion that the Hamas is your real enemy. The reality is so simple, even a seven-year-old can understand. Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip, removing military bases and its citizens from Gush Qasif. Nonetheless, we continue to provide you with electricity, water, and goods. And this I know very well, very well, as during my reserve duty, I guarded the border crossings more than once and witnessed hundreds of trucks full of goods entering a blockade-free Gaza every day. Despite all this, for reasons that cannot be understood, and with a lack of any rational logic, Hamas launched missiles on Israeli towns. For three years, we clenched our teeth and restrained ourselves. In the end, we could not take it anymore and enter the Gaza Strip into your neighborhood in order to remove those who want to kill us. A reality that is painful but very easy to explain. As soon as you agree with me that Hamas is your enemy, and because of them your people are miserable, we will also understand that the change must come from within. I am acutely aware of the fact that what I say is easier to write than to do, but I do not see any other way. You who are connected to the world and concerned about your children's education must leave together with your friends a civil uprising against Hamas. I'll stop there. And that was, um, yeah, that's a real letter that was written by a soldier. And if you would like to be involved in Talia's project and helping her find stories, um, she has a flyer in the back, and she probably is holding one now, so she'll be happy. <laughs> but she can get some, so, you know, and if you know someone that it should go to, please take it and share stories. Stories are one of the ways that we connect. It's about connecting. It's about making transformation. In our stories, we know each other. And I'd like to introduce the next storyteller who works in partnership with the Story Box with the Multicultural Center, a great center that you can go and, and uh, address many stories among many other things, uh, full of rich programming. And behind some of that is Christina Capoletti. <laughs> Five foot one and three quarters. All right, hi. Well, I'm Christina Capoletti, and I am... Um, I work with communications and marketing over at the Multicultural Center. And um, I'm not going to introduce this story other than to tell you the title and go right on into it. Um, can I, am I heard pretty well in the back there? Okay, good. That's better. All right. Um, this story is called A Peacenik, A Soldier, and Clifford. That's right, the big red dog. It all started when Leon walked up to the mic to share his story at the Storybox launch. A woman in the audience took in his G.I. Joe look, short hair, muscled body, and shook her head. She figured she wouldn't relate to anything this army dude had to say. She had grown up a gowny in a small college town at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains. The Gownies were the kids of the professors. The Townies were the kids of just about anyone else in the town. 
She had been taught that you go get an education to escape the life of a townie, early pregnancy for girls, and the military for boys who ran away from the girls that they impregnated. On top of that dire prediction, she was raised a flower child of peace activists' parents. She and her siblings were not allowed to use the word hate and were not allowed to even put their fingers in the shape of a gun for play. Her father's work as a physics professor kept him from the draft, and her mother worked for social justice causes. When she turned 12, her parents told her to start writing documents for her conscientious objector folder. That was probably the first big word she learned in her life. Wars in her childhood years meant trips to the state house or the campus to join in the protests. She learned to distrust anything that had to do with US military activity against people in other lands. So when young G.I. Joe walked up to the mic, she felt her chest tighten against him. Then Leon shared his story, a childhood story about how he had learned an important lesson about love. Leon told how during school one day, an adult came to read to the class dressed as Clifford the Big Red Dog. To show off to his best friend, Leon told how he waited until he was up close to Clifford and then punched Clifford right in the nose. He told how he then ran off outside of the school to go hide to avoid getting in trouble. He motioned how he had to cram himself up inside a tractor tire on the playground and wait there for a long time crammed in that tire to avoid being found. He told how he later went home thinking he had escaped trouble only to find his mother waiting for him at the table. She already knew what he had done. To his surprise, he learned from her that Clifford had been his best friend's mother, dressed up in a Clifford costume to come read to the kids at school. He told how ashamed he felt and how, of course, he had to apologize to his best friend's mother, something that was very hard for him to do. The woman listening shook her head again. Serves him right, she thought. Her suspicion confirmed that this was a pre-military show of little boy violence to show off his strength. But Leon's story did not end there. He continued his story that several years later, as he graduated from high school and prepared to go off into military service, actually, in the Middle East, his best friend's mother surprised him with a special gift, a little stuffed Clifford dog to take with him. She told him that when he felt like he needed to hit something, to hit the little Clifford dog. In that moment of his story, the woman found herself moved to tears. She took a really good look at Leon then. The stereotype fell away, and she saw a sweet young man generously sharing a heartfelt story. She felt compassion for him and an understanding of the kind of humble gratitude he felt for the kindness shown to him by his friend's mother. Politics disappeared, and she felt a true connection to him as a person sharing a story of transformation. The woman waited until after the event to approach Leon. She began to explain her revelation, but it seemed too complicated to bother with at that point, so she simply looked directly into his eyes and said, thank you for your story. I really felt connected to you and that was important to me. He looked a little quizzically at her and said, sure. I thought to myself later about the magic of storytelling to heal and weave people together. And certainly isn't that about peace after all. <laughs>